Hi, Misha here. And in the first part or episode, we talked about different receiver types, really focusing on milled versus stamped, the pros and cons. In the second part or episode, we looked at different styles, types, methods of folding stock. Underfolding, right folding, left folding. And now in this third part episode, we're going to talk about caliber. And it would have been really good if I had, say, Romanian SAR1, SAR2, SAR3, or maybe Arsenal SLR104, FR SLR106, FR SLR107, FR. Basically the same gun, but in all three calibers. That's not how I tend to do it. I tend to like to have different calibers, different guns, kind of kind of mix things up, you know, pick my favorite. So with that, I decided to lay out RPKs. Even though these are all different, at least they all have a 23 and a quarter inch barrel, bipod, heavy duty receiver. These two have a stamped with a heavy duty trunnion. This is milled. They're, they're pretty good as far as rough equivalency to each other. And so we're going to talk about the three main calibers you'll be looking at in, in a case. Now there are plenty of others, of course. You, find, you can find 7.62 NATO 308. You can find 7.62 by 54R. You can find uh, even some more interesting things like a 30-06, 6.5 or 6.8 in some cases even like 243 but we're going to talk about kind of the three main military calibers as it were therefore up here i have my romanian cougar aes 10b chambered in 7.62 by 39 then i have my russian molot FM RPK 74 chambered in 5.45 by 39. And then down here, I have my Bulgarian Arsenal SA RPK 5 chambered in 5.56 NATO, aka 223. So we're going to talk about several aspects pros and cons parts, magazines, and uh, frankly, how they shoot, how they handle. In fact, uh, just for fun, why don't we start off there. Again, these are roughly equivalent to, uh, to each other. And I have shooting clips of these all going to the range. So... I would check those out and then I'll kind of give my impressions that I've gathered over the years of shooting these. How's that sound? AES 10B, first mag. <laughs> Good. FM, RPK 74. Say RPK. Now these three guns are all from military type factories. So reliability has always been as close to a hundred percent as the real world allows. And since these are RPKs, Recoil, flip, even flash is pretty minimized because of the heavy barrel, bipod, and what have you. It is worth saying, though, in general terms, 762 by 39 is a wider, a larger, heavier bullet, but it's also lower velocity. Versus... 
545, which is a much smaller diameter bullet, but also higher velocity. And then, of course, 5.56 is nearly the same. Small diameter, high velocity. So in shooting terms, these two feel about the same. The impulses behind 7.62 by 39 are a little different. One thing I will say, because of the lower velocity, the barrel, the weapon, tends to heat up more slowly with 7.62 by 39, be it an RPK or a 16-inch rifle. Comparing 5.45 and 5.56, both do heat up quicker, but in my experience, and it's just my experience, 5.45 heats up a little bit quicker. Seems to be coming out of the barrel cooking a little bit more. But, and this really applies when you're talking about a 16-inch rifle more than one of these, I find that 5.56 has slightly more felt recoil, slightly greater muzzle climb. Again, could be subjective, but, you know, just talking about what I've kind of felt over the years. Take it for what you will. As far as countries that issued these guns, 7.62 by 39 is ubiquitous. It has been adopted around the world, produced in almost all of the former Warsaw Pact nations, and is still in use today. 545 by 39 on the other hand, was just coming into use in the comm block when things started to fall apart. So it was made by a much smaller number of nations. Yes, Russia has and still does mass produce these, but many European nations did not build these. For example, Hungary never did. Czechoslovakia never adopted 545. Poland and East Germany did, but quite late on, and then retired it within just a few years. Romania is one of the few outside of the former USSR that still uses it in any numbers. So the guns and therefore parts, accessories, magazines for them are um, far less common than 762 by 39 now when you get into 5.56, things get even more interesting. With these two, we have a certain standard. The AK-47, later the AKM standard, and the AK-74, and then later the AK-74M standard. So, yeah. But with 5.56, by the time countries started doing AKs in this chambering, they did their own thing. This means that Yugoslavia, Serbia, Zastava, did their own specifications, as did Bulgaria, as compared with Poland, as compared with Russia, and even as compared with China. This is why in 556, parts do, do not always interchange and there are many reasons for this. Again, they were all kind of designed more or less independently. Also, some were based on the AK-74 trunnion. Others were based more on the AKM trunnion. This can cause issues. And of course, that also leads to magazine compatibility and options. Pretty much all 762 by 39 guns from the AK-47 through current modern day use the same magazines and likewise even though the AK-74s and this case RPK-74s were used by fewer people the magazines still interchange between Russia Bulgaria Poland although Romania's mags are ever so slightly different
but they still will interchange. But then 556, five, you have to be more careful. That's not to say mags from different countries don't interchange, but it's not a guarantee, whereas with these other two, it, it pretty much is. And with that, why don't we skip over and check out some magazine variants and options and talk about cost and availability and all that. Because, you know, a rifle is great, but most rifles today only come with one mag. And you're definitely going to want more than, more than that. So I would say magazines, the quality, the cost, and the capacity are very important when trying to figure out which caliber you might like to pick up. Truly a rifle is only as good as its magazine. And a magazine is a wear part. You, you really do need more than one because they will wear out, they will get damaged, they will get lost. Plus, you don't always want to be reloading at the range. So with that, I've laid out kind of a sampling of a few magazine types for the calibers here. 223 on the right, 545 in the middle, and 762.39 on the left. These are just a sampling, not even close to all sizes, types, much less, <laughs> much less, um, all the makes and variants and all that. Although if you would be interested in a magazine video, it's been a little while since I've done one, so let me know in the comments. And with that, yeah, let's just start talking about 762 by 39. In all respects, the magazine situation is best with this caliber. For one, the AK has used the same mag in this caliber from the very beginning with the Type 1 all the way through current day with, say, the AK-103. And pretty much every variant uses the same basic mag, mag pattern. So they've been produced for the longest time by the most number of nations in huge numbers. Tons of variants, several different sizes. This makes them easier to find and affordable, and it also means if you get a 760 by 39 gun, any mag you find from Russian to Romanian to Chinese to American should work with maybe the exception of some mag well fitting. Now the original mags were the slab side. I didn't bring one out just because. This is the one you're going to mostly come into contact with when it comes to surplus. Steel, ribbed. This was essentially adopted along with the AKM and has been made in tons of countries. The good thing about steel mags, they are durable. They're good looking. This pattern with the ribbing isn't terribly heavy. The bad thing is they can dent, they can rust. Most of them have metal followers. 30 rounds was the standard mag capacity from the beginning and still is today. But there are some 20 round so-called tinker mags. These are developed in a few countries, namely the ones you'll find are either from Hungary or in smaller quantities, Romania. And these are kind of handy because they're easier to get in and out, especially if you have a foregrip. They also hold exactly one box of ammo, which is kind of neat. I recommend them. If you find a Romanian, it'll be smooth on the bottom. Those are worth actually some good money. This is Hungarian. I brought out this one just because they're kind of common on the market today, although once they were hard to find. This is a Zastava, so Yugo or Serbian or Croatian bolt hold open mag. When it comes to military mags, this is pretty much the bolt hold open follower you'll find. Plenty of aftermarket American mags have them though. They have a somewhat simplified ribbing pattern. And quality is a little all over the place. Generally they work well, but there are some ones out there that don't maybe work as great. So the more you know type situation. And finally, just to represent modern polymer mags, WBP. This is their clear. Polymer mags have been manufactured for these 
Well, since 1968, the so-called Bakelites were made in Russia, but there's tons of different types. Of course, Magpul in the USA. Poland makes them, Russia makes them. They're light, they don't rust, they don't dent. They either work or they don't work. And they're usually pretty inexpensive. Now those are the uh, 30 rounders and 20 rounder there. For the RPK that we started off with, we had some higher capacity magazines. Here is the original 40 rounder. I believe this one's Romanian. Yeah, much longer, but same basic pattern. These are neat, but because of the longer body, they can dent easier, but they will fit not just in an RPK, but of course a standard AKM. Here we have a more modern Arsenal version. These are usually considered to be among the best types of mags on the market. There are some fake ones, so be careful. Make sure it has the proper circle tin on it. But if you get a real one, this is very high grade polymer. They are still reinforced. Of course, they make these in 30 rounds. I just happened to grab a 40. And then finally, drum mags. 760 by 39 drums abound. I'm just keeping mine in the pouch. That's typically how they were. Most of your European nations will use the so-called top-loading drum, which is made of pretty heavy steel and is relatively compact for what it is. 75 rounds, blued or phosphate or a paint finish. There are also the so-called back-loading drums, which are typically Chinese or made from Chinese origin like the Korean mags. And um, they're a little bit bigger but also slightly thinner steel. Again, personally, I prefer the top loaders. They just seem a little more, uh, little more durable, in my opinion. And again, there, there are tons of different 7.60 by 39 mags. 30 round being the standard, but 20, 40, 75 round, even some 100 round drum. There are some longer like 50 60 100 round stick mags out there but they're american made and they're pretty pretty iffy so what about 545 by 39 again just kind of laying out a rough sampling in russia 545 started off with the bakelite mags as they're called a g4 material these were also made in east germany but that was about it. Not many nations made the Bakelite pattern. A lot of them used them, but they weren't made in a lot of nations. And there was a larger version made for the RPK-74. But in the 80s, some nations would actually make steel 545 mags, 30 rounds. Namely, this one's Polish, Romania also made one. And that's because those nations kind of developed their 545 guns from the AKM instead of the AK-74 as it were. An easy way to tell these mags from their 762 counterparts, if you look on the 762 you'll notice no cuts on the top here. But if you look on the 545 you'll notice slots cut in the side that is for the clip guide to load these with 15 round chargers or stripper clips so if you're unsure you can look there also as you can probably tell these have less of a curve they're a straighter mag and this is actually still what Romania uses today but here we get into the polymer mags and most of these are going to be your slab side. This one is Bulgarian, as it happens. Poland made a version very similar to this after these. Russia has a version like this too. 
These are true polymer. They are metal reinforced. They don't rust or dent. And they're probably a little bit more dur oops, a little bit more durable. We're testing durability than a Bakelite. And probably a little lighter weight too. It's all around very good mags. You can find these in different colors too. Today everyone makes what's called true black. But back in the day, colors were all over the place. Sand, brick, plum. And these were made, like I said, a variant like this in Poland, Bulgaria, Russia. But all of these are 30 rounds, which is very much the standard for the AK-74. Moving up here, we have a modern Russian Molot RPK-74 mag, which is in... 45 capacity not 40 but 45 it too still has the guide at the top for chargers and this started off as a bakelite material ag42 then they would go to plum with these ribs and now they do the black polymer a little long but uh here still neat for what they are unfortunately a little hard to find too and then finally most recently out of Russia Molot and Ishask Ishmash did develop a quad stack or a casket mag which holds 60 rounds now those are very rare in this country, but a variant, a copy made by Puff Gun, has come in in large numbers, and that's what we have here. It does have a steel lug. And the benefit of this is lengthwise not much more than our 30 rounder. And actually less than our 45 rounder by a little bit. And we're holding 60 rounds. And these are ridiculously simple inside. And they're probably the largest capacity available. At least as it usually goes for 545. Drums, while they were tested in Russia for the RPK-74, were never put into mass production. So if you want a drum mag... You're going to go 762 by 39. Otherwise, you know, you're going to do a stick mag or a coffin casket mag. Now, 60 rounds is it's pretty close to 75, so, you know. And these are very light. And these puff gun mags are actually quite well made, in my opinion. But you notice there are fewer options. Essentially... Whereas every country made some 6239 mags, only a few countries made 545 mags. And the only U.S. maker I can think of off the top of my head is Magpul. But then with 223, things even get more interesting. With the 2x39 calibers, the countries pretty much followed the Russian pattern for magazines, even if they had their own variants. But with 223, each country did its own thing. And one of the first countries to make an AK type gun in this caliber, although, as I've said, I don't consider it one, it was, was the Galil. IWI today, IMI in the past, in Israel. And I decided to bring these mags out because quite a few AKs, for example, Segas, were converted here in America from low cap to standard capacity to take Galil mags. So even if I don't consider the Galil an AK, I consider that there are AKs that are made to take its mags. So here we have a standard 35 round mag. These are made of steel. Pretty thin, honestly. Let's compare it to this one here. And uh, actually quite short for having 35 cartridges in it. When these are new, they work really well, but 
the steel is not the thickest and the springs can kind of wear on these so if you're buying surplus ones be mindful if you want say four good mags you might want to buy five or six because you might get a dud in there and then we have the big one this is their 50 round version meant for say squad automatic lmg use and this thing is really long let's compare it here to the uh, 545 mag oh yeah it's a good inch longer <laughs> of course it does hold 50 rounds versus 45 on that one and when these are new again they work well but there's so much room for these to get beat up especially for military service because they kind of monopod from the gun so if you're buying these used either see what you're getting first or don't pay too much because usually there will be dents and dings towards the bottom but they are cool looking i'll give them that So the Galil, along with the Valmet, which had 30 and 15 round mags, those were kind of the original 223 AK types. In the 80s, we didn't have a lot of action in 223, but in the 90s, after the fall of the Warsaw Pact at the end of the Soviet Union, quite a few nations started rechambering or making all new AKs for 5.56 NATO. And one of the most famous in America today is, of course, Arsenal, Circle 10 out of Bulgaria, because we've received milled and stamped guns from them. And they have two basic styles. Originally, they did a 30-round so-called Waffle True Black. They've also done these in some other colors. Again, these are metal reinforced. There's a couple of generations. The early ones actually had the strip guides. On the top like an AK-74 mag. This is a later production one. These are generally considered to be extremely high quality. But do are quite expensive. On the other hand we have the smoke or clear arsenal mags. And these were introduced in the early 21st century and the first generation had trouble with spider web cracking up here because of the polymer used now one interesting thing even after being spider web cracked a lot of these still worked just fine but they were cosmetically unsightly but they did kind of go back and reinforce the polymer mix around 2010 2009 in that time period they also make these in 30 rounds a lot of people still prefer the black, but sometimes you can't get them and you go for the clear. I've actually found the clear to be pretty, pretty good, but I find the black to fit a little better because actually the clear are a little bit thicker up front. If you look at the locking lug versus here, to kind of strengthen the polymer, they made the front the top excuse me a little bit thicker so these won't always fit in AK's wall stripes and over here we have another one that's pretty common in America this is the Polish Burial mag made by FB Radom WBP of Rago Poland also makes a very similar mag these are the modern green translucent notice they still have the clip guides on the top Originally, the mag for the burial looked very much like this one. Just with a reworked follower for the new cartridge. Then they went to a true clear one, very similar to this, but they had trouble with it. So this is the third generation of Polish burial mags. Now these aren't metal reinforced up here, but that's not a huge problem. They work plenty well for their life expectancy. And these are only done in 30 rounds today. For a while, Radom was doing a 20 round version, but they have discontinued that. And these are, yeah, kind of a takeoff from the Tantal mags in that country. Now, these are only a sampling. There are plenty of other 223, 556 AK mags. For example, China 
had not one, but two different patterns of 223 mag. One for Norinco guns, and one for Polytech. Like I said, Finland had a pattern of 223 mag. And, of course, Zastava, Yugoslavia, now Serbia. They make the M85, the M90, M95, and now the M21. Originally, they had steel mags. Similar to these. And more recently, they do kind of a black matte finish mag. And on top of that, East Germany, then later just Germany, may were known as Uyghur mags or Ouija mags. Which were kind of from an aborted 223 project they had. Here's the thing. You have to really be careful about which mags interchange. And I could do a whole video just on that. I'm not going to do it now. But I will say these burials will feed from these great. These with a little bit of fitting. And these feed, fit if they fit at all very tight. Arsenals will take all of the these two. Plus the FB or WBPs. Although sometimes... They'll fit a little loose, nothing too bad. And if you have a Vepr or a Sega in America that was converted, say by Century or someone else, some of them were converted to take Galil mags, some were converted to take Arsenals, and some of them use the original Russian style. For example, Russia has a mag very much like this, but a little bit straighter for 223.556. So it's a whole thing, and if you have a Chinese gun, then you're in your own, kind of in your own boat. But I just wanted to mention that. So my, the takeaway is, mag availability, easy to find, more variants, lower cost, 760 by 39 easily. As far as 545 and 556, they're pretty equal on availability, depending on which exactly we're talking about. The nice thing about 545, you don't have to worry about interoperability. They're pretty much universal across the board. There was a little bit of complication with Romanian mags, but let's not get into that here. But with 556, you really do need to make sure the mags you're buying will fit your particular gun. And don't be surprised if you have to do a little bit of file fitting or minor you know, work to make things lock in properly. But you do definitely want the right mag for your gun because, I mean, that's what controls feeding, reliability, even some safety factors. So don't, don't go cheap on mags. And with that, let's move on. And again, if you'd like to see a full mag video, let me know and I'll try to put one together in the future. So let's break this down kind of one-on-one. -on -one. And to begin... 7.62 by 39 versus 5.45 by 39. And the best place to start are with Romanian guns because these are the first 5.45 imports we ever had in, in America is uh, complete working semi-autos. So I've got my SAR-1 out and my SAR-2. And there was also, yes, an SAR-3 chambered for 5.56. But I went with these two because they are based on Romania's real military service guns. The SAR-1 is based on the PM-63 series, and later PM-90. And the SAR-2 is a semi-automatic PA-86. <clears throat> so it was neat because we had a whole family, and they were imported very similar, 16-inch barrels, original receivers... The first generations like these still had the standard magwell. But you found SAR-1s in almost every gun shop that, that carried AKs. But for the SAR-2s, unless you were in a big city, you had to special order these. And that's because in the late 90s and early 2000s, 545 ammo was very uncommon. It was not a domestic source. It was all imported and it was not imported all year round it usually came in batches whereas 762 by 39 sure was uh 
was mostly imported as well, but it was imported from multiple countries, multiple sources, and because there were so many guns, yeah. On top of that, between 1994 and 2004, we had the Federal Assault Weapons Ban. And you could get 545 mags. In fact, they were, while they were not common, they actually were not very expensive because so few people own, owned a gun that would, as I was saying, because fewer people had guns, in fact, in the early 21st century, very few 545 gun owners, so the mags stayed reasonable. But you could find tons of pre-ban 760 by 39 mags, so they stayed affordable as well. Luckily, spare parts for the SAR-2, at least ones you would break, like components of the trigger group were standard. But let's say you needed to find another barrel for some reason. You, would, you wouldn't do it then, and you, you wouldn't do it now. Whereas 760 by 39 barrels, yeah, th those are still easily found, easily gettable. Both are very reliable. And I think most agree the SAR-2 is a lot of fun to shoot. But it does have the propensity for heating up very quickly because this is a quite thin barrel. Luckily it also cools off quickly. And having the muzzle brake on, which these didn't, did not originally come with, really helps with recoil checking as well. I don't know. They're both really good guns. And I really like having both. I would say, in, in absolute terms, the SAR-2 is more interesting because it's just less common. But for most people, just wanting NAK, the 7.62x39 is, is more practical. It does make more sense. It's easier to customize. Magazines are more varied and easier to get. Spare parts are easier to get. Less concern there. Now, the reason I don't have an SAR-3, back then they had quite a mixed bag reputation. The 1s and 2s were known to be more reliable. Now, the SAR-3 was based on the PM-97, which was a commercial-slash-export model. It wasn't really one that the Romanian military used. So, already there, it was made to commercial standard. They basically took an SAR-2, they took a a PA-86, and rechambered it for 5.45. Excuse me, for 5.56 over 5.45. So you're not going to get quite the level of reliability with the longer X-45 cartridge. But really the big problem with the SAR-3 wasn't the gun's fault. It was the fault of the regulations. At that time, they could not import new production Romanian 5.56 magazines because assault weapons ban. So they had to make do with AK-74, 545 mags, typically East German, that they attempted to retrofit to work with 556 by changing the, uh, the follower and a couple other minor details. Some of these conversions were better than others because they were pretty much done on an ad hoc basis. But a gun is only as reliable as its magazine, and unfortunately the SAR-3 suffered from its magazine a great deal. The later Wasser 10, Wasser 2, and Wasser 3, when the Wasser 3 was able to ship with its correct new production mags, definitely showed that, um, that it worked better. But, yeah, we're talking about 545 versus the 762 here, and the, the SAR1s were vastly more popular. More people knew about them, more people wanted them, this was always kind of a niche gun for the more advanced collector or someone who just read an article about the, po the poison bullet and just had to have one. That would be me. I just thought it was weird and neat, so I special ordered one. <laughs> and uh, absolutely no regrets. It's been a great gun for me all these years. But... I do recognize the simple the fact that for most people, 
they're going to want to uh, to go with that. But the SAR2 always seemed to be more reliable than the SAR3, even today. And I think that's because it's based on a real military gun, not a commercial one. With that, let's move on. Next, let's talk about Bulgaria and their decisions just it pertains to calibers and while I'm not saying they were right or wrong it's very clear how they felt Bulgaria began licensed AK-47 type 3 production in 1960 at least officially and they never switched to the stamped receiver AKM they really liked their milled AKs in 7.62 by 39 and they would update and kind of streamline the design and that's what my um, SA-93 set up here like with the late style hand guards, the paint finish and the wonderful salmon stock in the 80s though kind of bowing to pressure from Russia they would adopt the at the time new 545 by 39 cartridge and they would start manufacturing stamped receivers they would make exact licensed copies of say a 1982 1983 Soviet AK-74 and also the AKS-74 and even the AKS 70U, 74U, the crank. And that's kind of where they would be with 545 throughout the 80s. And they would start doing stamped receivers. Although, interestingly, they never really stopped doing 762 by 39 in the milled receiver. Not completely. But the interesting thing. Between 1989 and 1991, communism was falling apart all throughout Eastern Europe and eventually Soviet Russia. And what was Bulgaria's response? Well, they very quickly ditched 545. And for that matter, the stamped receiver. In the 90s, they very quickly transitioned back to the milled receiver. Kind of combining features of the 74, like the center barrel, the 90 degree gas block, but again with the milled receiver, and then having modern polymer furniture and what have you. And they would even update the furniture, like this up here. And they would make them in two calibers 7.62 by 39 but very quickly 5.56 NATO because they were hoping to join NATO in the West and if they were going to do that they would need to be able to use the same calibers and what have you what they did not continue making were 545 guns these are very quickly declared obsolete in Bulgaria, and this is why so many Bulgarian parts kits have appeared in America. As far as our semi-auto history, this was the first one brought over starting in 1994. Next, we would get the SLR-95 and the SLR-101, which are very much like a Ban era version of the SAM 7R up here. So far, these would all be in 7.62, but then in the late 90s, we would see some 5.56 assembled guns in America, like the KR-101, but in small numbers. The first 5.45 arsenal would be this gun here, the SLR-105, and these would only be sold a few hundred and only for a couple of years between 2005 and maybe into early 2006. And then they would be gone. But that's a story for another day. The point of the matter is, Bulgaria, the military felt, 
that 762 by 39 and 556 were both preferable to 545 by 39. Now this was definitely more political than it was, strictly speaking, performance-based. Because the reality is, military-grade 556 versus military-grade 545 ammunition does have a very similar performance. There are differences, but they're extremely similar. So there was no need to have both. There was still a need to have 760 by 39 they felt for different situations. So that would be the larger caliber, larger slower, and 556 NATO would replace 545 in the Bulgarian military by the 21st century. And keep in mind Bulgaria was not exactly flush with cash. So yeah, yeah, that was their decision for what it's worth. So what do I think? Well, Bulgarian 556 versus 545. I know this is a mill, this is a stamp, it's not really fair. You've already had my take on the SLR 107R. It's a commercial gun, and so I don't really have much truck with it. But a milled 556 gun is offered in Select Fire. And once upon a time, Bulgaria issued a ton of 545s. Of these two, they shoot very similarly. Both are very reliable and smooth. Because this is an early arsenal, it's just a very nicely made gun. Then again, this is also pretty uncommon because this is the first time a the SAM-5 is the first time a 5.56 milled import has ever come in from Bulgaria. I would have a very, very tough time picking between these two. But if I absolutely had to, I would definitely pick the 5.45 here. But not because I think it is a better option, just because I really like the look of it, and I like the fact that this is the only true AK-74 spec import we've ever had. The handful of other 545 imports we've had been lucky to get are not original 74 spec. But this is sure a nice gun too. I will say apples to apples. This to me has less felt recoil. I think part of it is the large 74 brake, whereas this just has the small fish gill. I also think part of it, even though this has a milled receiver, this is a stamp, this has wood furniture, this is plastic, so weight-wise they're pretty equal. And I think the plastic maybe transmits recoil. To me, while it's not unpleasant at all, the SAM-5 does have a bit more felt recoil, a bit more flip and blast than the SLR-105. But as with the remaining guns, this does have a, a propensity for heating up faster. So you're not going to get as many shots off before you need to let it cool. This thing tends to go for a while before getting absolutely toasty. But very high quality guns either way. And uh, super happy these are around. And uh, really wish more of these had, uh, had come in. But I get it. Um... If they had kept on with 545, they would not have had compatibility with NATO. Doing 556 gave them that. This has a 1 in 7 twist, so it's good with the modern 62 grain. Also, having owned an SAM5R back in 2005, I can tell you then, 15 years ago, 545 AK-74 mags were a lot easier to get than 556 Bulgarian waffle mags. Today, it's more evened out, but years ago, yeah, mags for these were, were difficult to find. So with that, why don't we compare these two? So, SAM-7 versus SAM-5. The SAM-5 is in pretty standard, basic AR-M1 furniture. 
whereas the Sam 7 is in the updated modern AR M9 furniture, which I really like this furniture. And while the Sam 7 is a great shooter, I really enjoy shooting this gun in 5.56. It has very little flip. The recoil is different. It's a uh, there's an impulse, but it's kind of very quick and over. With 762 by 39, it's kind of strung out a bit because you are flinging uh, a larger slug down range. Of course, this will feed from any standard AK mag. Both of them take milled furniture, especially the buttstock and the lower handguard. This was originally threaded. 14, but I put a 24 mil front sight on it. Kept the 14 on this one, why not? And of course, these are simply less common. Ironically, as of right now, cost, dealer cost on a SAM 7R is actually 100 bucks more than retail cost was on the SAM 5 just six months ago. Luckily, right now, mags for these are exactly the same price as Bulgarian mags for these. So, you know, whichever you like, but I absolutely don't feel like this is a uh, rubbish gun. It is a military quality gun. I think Arsenal really brings its A game with its milled receivers, regardless of the caliber. But again, they don't offer 545 mill guns, except for a, a small run of RPKs they did 10 years ago. So, you know, your pick, but I would say I like the 556 five, just a little more. But I said this is a military grade gun. That's not always the case. From the beginning in the 90s, Arsenal built its reputation here on its milled receiver, something it touted very heavily on its website. There was the SLR 105 and 545 with a stamped receiver, but okay, that was a bit of an anomaly. But then in 2006, they announced a new line. The SLR 107 in 762x39 and the SLR 106 in 5.56. Eventually, later joined by the 104 and 545 with a folding stock. I don't own any of the 107s. And the only 106 I own is this one here because I like the intermediate barrel length look. But the stamped receivers of these seem to basically be made for the U.S. market. Yes, they are lighter, but they also are significantly cheaper to produce. And to be fair, when they were introduced, they were significantly cheaper than the milled equivalents at the time. But I would really classify these as more commercial grade versus military grade firearms, the ones we've received. And that's why usually when you hear problems with arsenals, they tend to be surrounding the SLR-106 and sometimes even the SLR-107 series. Rarely do you hear of issues with their mill guns. So my point is, regardless of caliber, if you can, especially with current prices so crazy on the SLR-107 FRs today, get the mill guns. That seems to be where Arsenal's bringing their A-game for various reasons. And it, j it just seems to be the better, the better bet. Now my 106 CR has been reliable here, especially after I chopped the barrel down to 12 and a half inches. When I got it with the 16 inch barrel, it did feel a bit overgassed, a little punchy. When it got cut down to proper length, it uh, is a much softer shooting gun. I'll give it credit there, and it's a lot of fun, but. It just doesn't seem quite 
is well done. And I think that's because it's not the same as off their military production line in Bulgaria. That's not to say stamp guns can't be good, but they still choose to go with milled. So, in my opinion, that's the way I would go if I were you. Flipping these over real quick, I want to show you. It does have the magwell dimples, which are nice. But you'll notice where the trigger pins are. There's no Y stamp for a third axis pin. It just has the X and the one for the trigger and the hammer. Typically, if you look at like the SAR-1 or military guns or even a Wasser, because the shells are kind of from the same producer, they will have the Y stamp for the auto or out of battery safety. It's just never drilled out. But with these, it never had one, which kind of tells me that these were always intended to be semi-automatic only receivers. Again, still very good guns. Nice folding stock. A reinforcing plate above the pistol grip. But when people hear the name Arsenal and how great they are, how smooth, how accurate, they are thinking of the milled guns, regardless of caliber. The milled ones are the smooth guns. These are average for a stamped gun. But these were the only ones you could get in 5.56 for a very long time. And again, all of Arsenal's 5.45 guns are stamped. So if that's what you want to do, that's where you got to go. And with that, let's skip on over to Russia and talk about the AK-100 series. The reason I wanted an SLR 106CR was Russia. Of course, in the 1980s, they had the AK-74 and the AKS-74, several variants. After the end of communism, the AK-74M was adopted, which combined many features into one, made many things standard, like the folding stock and the rail. So, Izhesk, now branded as Izhmash, today Kalashnikov Concern, could basically just produce one rifle to kind of fit all the needs and this would still be in 545 by 39 of course but this was for russia they were also interested in export and this is where the ak century series or ak 100 series comes from the ak 101 was chambered not for 545 by 39 but for 5.56 nato because the Russians recognized this was potentially more popular as an export caliber. Also, the AK-103 was the same, but chambered for 760 by 39 A few of the AK-103s were used inside Russia, but most were export, including to Venezuela, which would adopt it as a kind of a standard-issue gun. So... There is greater interest, even after communism, in 760 by 39 than there is 545 by 39 around the world. Now these would be full length, 16 and a quarter inch, 415 millimeter barrel guns. The AK-74M, the AK-101, the AK-103. Now they had the AKS-74U crank with its eight and a quarter inch barrel and very short gas system. But it had many issues, including overheating and relatively limited range. Therefore, they adopted an intermediate length with the 12 and a half inch barrel. The AK-102 was this gun chambered in 5.56 NATO. So that's what I've gone for here, including putting a smooth top cover on it. The AK-104 was the 12 and a half inch gun in 762 by 39. And finally the AK105 was the 12 and a half inch gun in 545 by 39. These have been sold the 545 by 39 and the AK105 within Russia, but really nowhere else to speak of. But the 102 and the 104 have been sold to various kind of military contractors. So Russia recognized the importance of the NATO chambering 
not just at Ishmash either. Molot would do the RPK 201 in 5.56. And a 762 by 39 version would continue as the RPK 203. My ultimate point is about the only user of 545 is Russia herself. As well as a few satellite states like Ukraine that can't afford to switch away. And of course, Romania. Everyone else to either transition back to 762 by 39, never switched away from it in the first place, or has switched to 5.56 NATO. It has more of a political, logistical reason than anything else, but there you have it. Now, if 545 by 39 were significantly more reliable or effective, I don't believe so many nations would have switched over. Even with the enticement of compatibility with NATO, no one's going to pay money to downgrade significantly their service gun, in my opinion. Now, Russia was not the first to toy with doing 5.56 and an AK, far from it. Quite famously, Finland, Valmet, worked on some guns, the M71 and the M76 in 223, mostly for the U.S. civilian market. And of course, there is the Israeli IMI Goliel, but as I say in most AK videos, I don't quite consider it an AK. And that's not insulting it, that's actually giving it credit, because I think it's a better adaption, I think it's its own thing. So you can consider the Galil at AK if you like, and it was a major user of 223. But uh, all in all, Russia, also another early country to start doing 223 AKs, 5.56, was uh, Yugoslavia slash now Serbia. They did the M85, the M90, the M95, because they never adopted 5.45 at all there. I don't know, I'm just kind of giving you a brief rundown. Shooting my SGL 31. Of course, it's fun and reliable. Any of your Segas or Vepers from Russia in 5.56 are going to be quite well done, assuming the conversion work was uh, competently carried out. These are quite high-quality guns. They're not kind of quick slapdash guns like the SAR-3 was back in the day. And I'm not going to talk crap about the SLR-106 because I really like them. But to be fair, they've had more problems than any other Arsenal model. So, you know, that also has to be acknowledged. And with that, let's visit one more country and have some kind of final thoughts and uh, a bit more of my opinion on uh, where we should go depending on your situation. And we end with Poland, because much like with Bulgaria, they were faced with some choices after the end of communism. They had been working on their domestic 545 chambered gun since the early 80s. This would have course be adopted as, as the WZ-88 Tantal, so right before the end of communism. And they would go on and purchase 20, 25,000 of these and pretty much declare it immediately obsolete. This is why we started to see Tantal kits here in America in the early 21st century, and many of them looked in mint condition. They created it, and then they decided they didn't need it. Now, they did attempt at first to simply put a 5.56 by 45 barrel on it. This would result in the WZ-91. But it didn't really go anywhere. It was it was kind of like the PM-96, or excuse me, PM-97 from Romania. It was a little too ad hoc to be effective for military users. Instead, the military, instead of ordering more tantals, actually ordered more 762 by 39 AKMS underfolders as a stopgap while they worked on 
the Burial, which would become the WZ-96. Now, the WZ-96 might not look like a Tantal, but honestly, the bones are identical. Even the same handguard retainer and gas tube arrangement. Just very updated. Now, the Burial has an 18-inch barrel in 5.56. Whereas the Tantal and 545 was 16 inches. And of course we have the new scope mount here. But yeah, really the funny thing is it, it is just basically a Tantal updated. But it, done in a very competent, very extreme way with many new features and what have you. So it was a very successful design because... It was basically ground up designed for 5.56, which is the way to go if you want something that's military quality. Now, yeah, they made the WZ-96 for the Polish military in 5.56 because they were joining NATO. But they did offer it in other calibers. There was the Burial M762 by 39 or M762, which we have here. This was ultimately adopted by Nigeria. They also had the Burial M545, which no one adopted. So it never really went into serial full mass production. So the, the answer in Poland was clear. They preferred 556. And because of the work they did with their Burial, the high quality barrel... And just the, the good optics system. This is a very accurate gun. And I think most would say that the Burial is more accurate than the Tantal. Though the Burial M762 is probably not as accurate as either one because of the cartridge it's firing. And that's kind of the limiting factor of, of that round. So just kind of an interesting comparison of, of their decision-making process. And with that, let's talk about kind of pros and cons to each caliber here. And then we'll wrap it up. First, comparing 7.62 by 39 to the 5.45 by 39. As we talked about earlier, the 5.45 by 39 is a smaller, higher velocity, thus flatter shooting, thus, generally speaking, more accurate cartridge than 762 by 39 And while 545 does have the tumbling aspect, 762 by 39 is a heavier projectile, which does a better job at penetrating foliage and some other light cover. This is actually the reason in Finland that they say they've kept using 762 by 39 instead of switching to, say, 556 NATO. Again, the recoil impulse, this is going to have a little more climb, probably. But the higher velocity of this is going to have more of a, a pushback. But in automatic, it seems like the Tantal is probably going to be a little more controllable than the Burial in 762. 39 and the whole magazine things per train all that good stuff besides so it just kind of depends your on your need and a lot of militaries still stick with 762 by 39 because they have so much of the ammunition and so many of the magazines stuck aside plus common bolt components firing pins and, and what have you But as far as militaries are concerned, 5.56 is greater than 5.45, especially with the Brill here. This is a very accurate gun for what it is. It's very tested. It was made with modern techniques, and that's something you can say for some other new 5.56 AKs. Because they were designed and produced in the 21st century, it's possible that they, that they have taken advantage of newer techniques, uh, new, newer scientific methods, newer testing, more precise fitment. doesn't mean they would, but it's a possibility that they could. So, thus leading to, to better accuracy and what have you. As far as shooting, yeah, the, 
the archer or the burial has always just been a, a phenomenally nice shooting gun. It's not over gassed. It's well balanced for what it is. Of course, with all the stuff on it, it's pretty heavy. The Tantal is a good little gun. But because of the wire poker stock, which was standard, I have to say I prefer like the SLR 104 or SLR 105 to it. Yeah, it's probably my least favorite of the, my 545 guns to shoot. Not because it's bad at all, but you know, it just is what it is. And only recently acquiring the Burial M762, I've actually been really impressed with how it shoots. It um, has less felt recoil than a lot of other AKs. Again, it doesn't appear to be overgassed. I don't know. They're all really high quality guns, and, and it shows. So that's for a military. What about, you know, civilian use in America? And this is honestly very highly subjective. 762 by 39 Ammo is quite easy to get in America, and while the price has gone up during these panics, it um, hasn't gone up as much as some of the other. Mags are easy to find, parts are easy to find, thus customization, like I said with the SAR-1. It's the standard AK. It will always kind of be, when someone wants an AK, this will be the caliber. Plus, it does kind of fill a niche in between, say, 308 762 by 51 NATO and 5.56 or some other small it's it's a, a true intermediate round and there aren't a ton of those out there and there are some good applications for it so i would still say 760 by 39 is probably for most people the best choice the real detractions would just be it's not as accurate as some others it's not bad i mean people are talking about how horribly accurate ak's are that that's no they're, they're perfectly fine for Battlefield. But it does have a certain limited range because it has a certain... Uh, the, the bullet comes out in an arc and it does have pretty good drop to it. It's a relatively slow and heavy bullet. So you're not going to get out to a thousand yards with it. So that's, you know, the biggest attraction, frankly. 5.56 five, in an AK has the advantage that this is really an extremely common cartridge in the USA and there are so many different loadings and guns like this especially this one because it has a 1 and 9 twist can handle commercial 223 Remington as well as military 556 so you're gonna have a lot of loading choices FMJ hollow point all kinds of stuff and 556 will always be available because it's made domestically. No worries about imports getting shut off and making the ammo go away. Although still a lot of the ammo we shoot is imported. It does have a little better effective range. Especially the 18 inch version here. Very good accuracy. It really kind of proves that the AK doesn't have to be inaccurate. That it's, it's fine. And you do get that. The downside, magazines are less common by far than 762 by 39 And sometimes, depending on which exactly uh, you, you choose in the, in the 556 arena, sometimes spare parts can be more difficult to find or proprietary. It, it just kind of depends. And again, you do have to kind of look at the one you're getting to see if it's more of a commercial grade or a military grade gun. You might find some that run into issues. It just depends. You know, be smart. You, you'll do all right. And it's becoming more of a kind of a good choice. Uh, in in the in the years past, this was the least favored, the redheaded stepchild. But because of changing times, five five six AKs are getting more and more popular. And it, it's nice. It really is. Uh, both with military users and civilian users in the USA. So I, I wish it well. And it does have that certain practical sense of the common cartridge. And some makers even make AR Magwell adapters for these. Although my opinion is for what it costs to buy the Magwell adapter and fit it, you could just buy factory mags. And they'll work better, just my opinion. 
So what about 545 in America today? Well, you are going to get better accuracy and range. Less climb than 762 by 39. On the flip side, the ammunition is less common. Magazines, less common. Spare parts, when they're proprietary, are less common. Fewer nations adopted it than 762. Although more would use an AK-74 type than use the various 223-556 types because of non-standardization. So there is that. And virtually all of the ammunition we rely on is imported, and even most of that is imported from Russia, which is kind of risky. There are one or two domestic makers, but it's pretty expensive, and there are one or two non-Russian sources for the ammo, but yeah, pretty much Russian ammo is what you're relying on. Meaning feeding it, there will always be 545 by 39 ammo in America, because there are enough guns here to warrant someone always filling that niche but it may not always be as cheap as you would like so why get it these are a lot of fun to shoot they have a lot of history but in the end it's novelty to be honest AK completionists collectors hobbyists I can't really think of anything this offers when I'm being truly objective over 5.56. With the much greater ammunition variety available for guns like these versus the relatively limited options for guns like these, it just, it really does not make a, make a lot of sense. But that's not to say you shouldn't get one. But I probably wouldn't get one as my primary home defense or trap gun. I would have something more like this for a collectible, a curiosity, and to be enjoyed at the range. It's just not practical for defensive use in America today. Not with the Russian sanctions and no more Romanian imports and the parts kits like the Tantals and the Bulgarian kits having dried up. So just, you know, be me mindful of what you're getting into. If you just want a high velocity round, yeah, look at the 556 five, options, the Burial, the Stavis M90, the Arsenal Sam 5, or you could always get a Galil Ace. So the reason to get these, you're a Cold War, War collector and you just like something unique and different. And there's nothing wrong with that. As far as the other calibers, 308, 762 by 54R. Understand all of these are going to be commercial grade. And where you, where you really run into problems there, things like replacement bolts and extractors can get very difficult to find, especially for the X-54R guns. So just be mindful of that. If you get one, that spare parts will probably ultimately be an issue. Heck, even magazines may be. But yeah, with the Part 1 and the Part 2, I thought kind of a frank discussion of calibers would be warranted. Again, subjective, my opinion. It's worth exactly what you paid for it. But I really do think for most people, 762 by 39 is still the way to go for an AK and will always be the way to go. But that's not to say don't get 545. Feel free to get it. I still own them. I'm not selling them. But don't get it thinking it's the new next wave that's going to kind of hit because it's not. This kind of ebbs and flows over time, but it'll never be more than kind of a curiosity, a fad, a trend. Because we're in America. And it will be interesting to see where 5.56 AKs end up. They're only now starting to really gain some attention and steam. It'll be interesting to see if this continues and then become truly popular. Or if it's kind of a fad 
and interest dies down. But with more guns coming out, including some U.S. makers like PSA and Kalashnikov USA saying they're going to do 556 five, guns, I guess in time we will we will find out, folks. So there you have it. Number one pick, number two pick, and last and truly not least, number three pick, in my opinion, and those are my reasons. But please, I'd love to hear yours in the comments below, so feel free to do that. We can have a fun discussion. Remember, no one's right, no one's wrong in this. This is all opinion and subjective experience. As always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to the Patreon page. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon. Next time.